So here's my disclosure. I have no financial disclosures. I have no products to sell. Just as importantly in this modern era, and none of the images you're going to see in Photoshop. A little trip down memory lane. Uh, my life in opioid for anesthesia began in this very room 31 years ago when the late Charles Lillard, the best surgeon from Las Vegas, came to present his diazepam ketamine technique. Uh, prior to that, in 1991, of course, I started work here down at Newport Beach uh, Hope Hospital. I was doing cardiac anesthesia. One of my friends introduced me to the late uh, uh, Fred Grazier and uh, the late uh, Ed uh, Damanskis. And we did cases in the early 80s, and then along came 1990, and Ed had a patient who was a breast dog patient who uh, died from fentanyl overdose in, in the office. It was very tragic, and when I approached him to uh, say, you know, would you like me to come get anesthesia in the office, he said, great, just use any drugs you want, but just no narcotics. So from the very beginning, all of my work for the last 26 years has been opioid-free by definition. Okay, it wasn't like I had some brilliant insight that maybe we could do better without opioids. It's just, no, if you're in this office, you're getting anesthesia, you're not having any narcotics, okay? So I gave my first propofol ketamine case in, in 1992 in March. Teaching my technique is very simple. Teaching cooperation is not. It's hard to know which side of the ether screen has more stubbornness. The surgeon who has to be the anesthesiologist to give 50 milligrams of ketamine before he injects the local, or the anesthesiologist who's asking the surgeon to give some more local when the surgeon's looking at a vasoconstricted field. So all of you are injecting local anesthesia with lidocaine and epinephrine, and anesthesia is the sum of hypnosis and analgesia. You're already giving analgesia. There's no reason to be giving opioids, okay? Numb patients tend to lie still. So we have a comment from Dr. Uh, Professor King, um, can we all just get along? Sometimes it's a real challenge getting cooperation from either side of the ether screen. So back to history, Professor Charles Lorito said it best. He said, that which anesthetizes least, anesthetizes best. You see the Queen Anne Victorian, which is my definition of multimodal anesthesia, contrasted with Bauhaus, which is, keep it simple, anesthesia. Less is more. Okay, in 2004, I wrote this article, Minimally Invasive Anesthesia for Minimally Invasive Surgery. And to my great surprise, a few years later, the anesthesia service at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden put it on their website. I said, well, one of my colleagues in anesthesia, well, wait a second, this is not an academic journal, this is a trade journal, it's an advertising journal, what are they doing with that? And they said, well, apparently the Swedes understand not everything useful is going to be found in level one RCTs. The other thing is, when I tried to convince one of my colleagues of the value of getting minimally invasive anesthesia, he said, Barry, that's wonderful, but the more drugs I give, the better I feel. I said, what about the patient? What about your patient? Okay. So in 1992, it was completely unknown. We only got propofol in this country in 1989, so we only had it for two or three years. It was 80 years. And nobody, well, basically what they were using propofol in those days was a bolus dose to replace the bolus dose of penofol to put patients to sleep. Nobody, because of the cost of the drug, was getting the drug continuously like I was. And certainly nobody was going to ask the question the sleep doses of propofol block ketamine hallucinations. So this is a totally new field. So I, hear, I show you Charlie Minnick's 1981 paper about diazepam ketamine. You notice he writes it with a hyphen in between. So since I didn't know much about writing and how easily people are confused when you read what you just have to say, I put the hyphen in as well, propofol ketamine, because Vinny wasn't mixing the two drugs, and neither was I. The hyphen was something that caused me a lot of grief. If you think of the 50 milligrams of ketamine as the ideal of for the propofol martini, it becomes much simpler to get your mind around. Now, Green was the guy who preceded me. He was the first person to talk about propofol with ketamine, but he was mixing the two drugs. I don't do that. I don't think that's a problem. It's just not what I do because I like to be able to measure the propofol and quantify exactly what's the ketamine doing. Do I need more ketamine? Do I need more propofol? And when you're getting them together, it's very hard to say. So who are my patients? These are all spontaneously breathing office space with cosmetic cases. They all had commercial insurance. Okay, here's the paradigm. 50. Propofol incrementally 
and 50 milligrams of ketamine and subcutaneous local anesthesia. That's it. And I keep asking my wife, how many ways can I find to slice the same loaf of bread to maintain some presence of, of what's going on? So these, all these searches include painful subcutaneous breast augmentation, classical abdominoplasties, liposuctions, all facial surgeries. These are aptly defined high-risk patients, that is, non-smoking female patients with previous nausea and vomiting and or motion sickness who are having metagenic cosmetic surgery. And I, I published a 0.6% virtually unknown nausea and vomiting, and yet no antiemetics were given. Why? Because opioids are the match that you're throwing in the gas to the sensitive patients. So my career goes over 26 years, over 6,000 patients with over 100 different surgeries. Not a single pain or post op nausea vomiting admission to the hospital. And that still remains the main cause for unexpected admission after day surgery. We also did no opioid addicts, and patients are discharged at home within an hour post op and did not require professional aftercare care. Dr. Kubert, was there any oral uh, medication given prior to the IV drug or no oral? Well, in the days when pro excellent question, in the days that propofol deprivan was very expensive, I thought I was being a clever fellow and gave two tenths quantity in 30 to 45 minutes ahead of time. And I published a statistically significant 30% reduction. And here I thought I was being so clever. And then it turned out once propofol became generic, the cost of getting it wasn't such a big deal. Prior to this, I was using 320 cc ampules an hour average, and with the quantity and the VIS monitor of two amperes an hour. And like we say, once the propofol became generic, it seemed to be less important to worry about the occasional possible hypotension from the clonidine. And I stopped using the clonidine, but I didn't go ahead. I still use the same. So, same two bottles an hour. So basically, the message is measuring is better than guessing. I'm gonna tell you later that there's a hundredfold variation between patients who achieve the same numerical level of sedation. And this is what I hope uh, history will be kind enough to remember me by. Immodestly called Freeberg's Triad. Measure the brain, preempt the pain, and medic drugs abstain. Somebody asked me over lunch whether medic drugs, uh, those are the drugs that cause you to be sick to your stomach, and notoriously, they are the opioids. And I want to show you how I put patients to sleep. This clip with two titles has been seen over 200,000 times on YouTube. This is a propofol only induction, no medazolamine. No oral sedation whatsoever, pure propofol, okay? The pump is set to 25 micrograms per kilogram per minute, and the bolus is 50 mics per kilo per minute. As a point of contrast, when people are inducing the propofol, they're typically getting 1,000 to 2,000 micrograms per kilogram. Massive gifts. What I found out doing it this way is that propofol is a happy drug. People love the propofol because they feel good, as did Michael Jackson, okay? And so I wrote an article that upset many of my colleagues called Happy Drugs for Happy Surgery because they're coming to you to increase their level of personal happiness with cosmetic surgery. So let's see. You'll notice there's no change in the pulse ox and there's no manipulation of the airway. Okay, let's see if we can make this run. Red uh, area G and G will start to decrease before the yellow the the I didn't realize you were so tall. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when I'm standing. <laughs> oh, 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 feels pleasant. It feels pleasant. It's like my ideal way to die. I'm like 106, you know? Yeah. Oh, my dog by my side, though. Okay, yeah. Oh, I'm a dog, This young lady is my shoulder. Will I be twitching? No, no twitching. I might be, be gassy because I didn't eat. Yeah, that's okay. We don't charge extra for gassiness. I'm feeling a little drunk. It's pleasant though, isn't it? It's a drunk feeling. I might say, I'm sorry, staff, but I might say shit that I don't know. Just don't worry, you know, I haven't had food since 10, so. It's okay. Nice. Isn't that nice? I know everybody likes Dr. Freeberg. And when I get home, can I eat? Yeah. 
Yes. Um, it happened immediately. Immediately. Okay, no, basically for it. Mm -hmm. If I wake up in the In the first five years before I uh, here, is it the red? First five years before I had the Fizz monitor, I collected data on Versed and Vaseline pre-medication, zero, two, and four milligrams because propofol was very expensive, and I thought, well, if two milligrams of Vaseline is good, maybe four milligrams is better, and if we're going to save propofol, by how much? Because the surgeons university love the propofol, but they said, can't you find a way to do it cheap? Okay, strange. Imagine that. Cost consciousness among plastic surgeons. I've never heard of such a thing, right? Okay, so much for the human intent. And it turned out I couldn't find any, any relationship at all. And so I abandoned Vaseline in June of 1997, and the next 40,000 patients who've got propofol only had not a single recall or awareness issue. There was no luck. So propofol, when given like this, is a wonderful anesthetic. It's a beautiful thing. Now we get to the issue of movement under IV sedation, which is the vexing thing for both the anesthesiologist and the surgeon. What you have to understand is that every movement is generated by the brain, as the headless chicken tells us. So movement, the brain is not required for patient movement. And the differential diagnosis when the patient flinches a little bit is, is this patient too light or do they need more local? Well, the first five years I gave propofol ketamine, no matter how much I begged and whined and told my surgeons, I couldn't get them to inject more local anesthesia when I knew that that would solve the problem the overwhelming majority of times. And the problem for surgery is that you're taught that the epinephrine and the lidocaine and the same syringe if you see vasoconstriction, you've got adequate anesthesia, not a problem. Well, the cooperation you need is if you give a little more local with most patient movement, especially when the patient is in the zone between 60 and 75, and the electromyogram is flat, as I'll show you here in the next slide. That's a patient who's asleep in amnestic and most likely will lie still if you just put a little more locally. Analgesia with sedation, okay? The thing I'd like to try my best to disabuse you of is that vasoconstriction, the presence of vasoconstriction, guarantees adequate analgesia. It just doesn't, okay? And without the monitor, it's very, very hard to say, okay, anesthesia, I accept your presentation, you, you, you. We'll, we'll do what you ask, all right? So what you see here in the flat portion, that's a flat EMG. If you see the patient in 60 to 75 bids with a flat EMG and they're wiggling a little bit, that patient just needs a little more vocal. It's objective. We don't have to have any bruised feelings about the patient too light and we need to be deep, okay? Now I want to introduce you to one of my favorite Surgeons, let's see if we can find areas. Everybody here know Nicanor Issei, one of the three people who advanced the endoscopic brow lift. Well, I worked with Nick for five continuous years and used the biz monitor on every single case, including all of his brow lifts and all of his facelifts. So, the main thing, unless you're putting an implant in, is that a facelift is not a truly sterile procedure like a breast lift. So, you can put the sensor alternatively up here and we would change the sensor from side to side as he was doing his dissection, and the only time you lose the signal is when the brow flap is completely elevated from the skull. So the BIS monitor, the bispectral index monitor, uh, has no units, and 98 to 100 is awake, 60 to 75 is moderate to deep sedation, 45 to 60 is hypnosis compatible with general anesthesia, and less than 45 is over-medicated. So what I'd like to explain very simply is that when the red goes up, the white goes in. This is the patient saying, Dr. Freeberg, I'm about to wake up. Would you please give me a little more propofol? 
to respond to this spike as if it was a change in heart rate and blood pressure. And what will happen is you will see very few changes in heart rate and blood pressure. The bids will stay pretty much in the range that you want. And the patient will look like a general anesthetic except they're breathing spontaneously. And in the early days, I gave no supplemental oxygen because patients didn't need it. So again, cooperation means we're not going to fight about the patient is too late and we're local. We don't want to have a contest of wills where the patient is the loser. Vasoconstriction simply doesn't indicate adequate analgesia. If you re-inject the patient movement without EMG spike, 98% of non-purposeful movement goes away. This is a pre entitled CO2 uh, abdominoplasty. As you can see, the abdominal wall has been reflected and the purple outlines the medial borders of the rectus sheath. This is room air spontaneous ventilation, no supplemental airway, no supplemental oxygen, and many people wouldn't be happy with a level of SPO2, but this is only a single respiratory depressant propofol titrated to both the, the uh, brainstem, the pulse oximeter, and the cortex visual. Hello. What this gives the anesthesiologist is a boredom killing device. This becomes a virtual video game found follow the bouncing ball with the EMG spikes. Heart rate and blood pressure are notoriously inaccurate um, reflection of cortical activity. In the same patient, less than five minutes after we turned, her, turned off the propofol. Yes? Really? Okay. Okay, Lily, what did you think about the experience? Was that pretty good? Yes. Did you remember anything? You've been asleep for four hours. Oh. Don't remember a thing. No bad dreams. No. Wonderful. So that was really a good experience then, huh? Yeah. And you like Dr. Lynn, don't you? Yeah. And he's the best. And yeah. Anais held your hand, and I held your other hand, and you had a good snooze. Cool. And no dreams? No. Fantastic. All right, let's begin your recovery. Now, I'm certain that everybody here has patients wake up exactly the same as I do, so I probably don't have much to offer. But in case they don't, this is something to consider. I want to talk a little bit about the variation in patients. This is an otherwise healthy 60 kilogram patient who is less than 10% of my low average dose. You tell an anesthesiologist that Dr. Friedberg had a patient sleep for four hours at two mics per kilo per minute, a propofol, they're gonna look at you like that. Nah, those patients don't exist, it's trust me. If you do enough patients, you, you will find these patients. I've had not one, but three of them. First lady said the first time they gave me propofol, I slept for two days. What, are you kidding me? Two days? Yeah. Two mics per kilo per minute for four or five hours, turned it off, she sat up and said, that was wonderful. I never heard of felt or remember a thing. So a little bit about facilities, at least here in, you know, around the world the country, is that level one is local anesthesia only. Of course, a lot of people are going to stretch that definition a little bit. IV sedation for monitored anesthesia care. But when you give monitored anesthesia care with opioids, you're getting systemic analgesia. And that really trades into the area. Is Big Mac really an intravenous general anesthetic? And general anesthesia for level three, of course, you need an anesthesia machine gauge for lean scavenging. And by the way, I bet not many of the offices that give general anesthesia are routinely conducting uh, malignant hypersomia. Hypothermia. Oh. 
challenges. So who's giving the propofol? Who's watching the airway? Some places around the country will use a respiratory therapist who's comfortable in managing an airway. Others will use a paramedic. And in California, it's mostly nurse anesthetists or anesthesiologists. So we get to the issue of safety. Is local really local? Or is it strictly local? So obviously, in ASC, one or two patients are ideal. Since all cases can be formed under local anesthesia only, if you're gentle with the tissue that has good injection technique and really good re-inject when the patient says, ouch, and I tell them it's only pressure, uh, the question then becomes, how much do we have to depress patients to provide good operating conditions for the surgeon and satisfactory level of consciousness alteration for the patients? Now, there are patients who only want local anesthesia. There are people out there who are pandering their practice to those patients, playing on the fears of anesthesia and the numerous bad anesthesia experiences out there. Uh, Pronox is another alternative for light sedation. Uh, dental offices use it, obstetrical offices use it. Some cosmetic patient offices are using it. You have scavenging issues. You can't just dump the nitrous oxide out of the environment just like you can't just dump the inhalational agents out of the environment. Dysimbia is a new popular item. So we found that one of our speakers is going to talk about that. The dose is 30 mics and it's given sublingual, which is something like an IV a dose if you have a nitroglycerin, if you have nitroglycerin experience. Typically about 50% of sublingual doses are absorbed. The problem that we have with sufentanil is it's 10 times more potent than fentanyl. All right? So the, and sufentanil has a six to nine hour half-life for surgeries that are typically two to four hours. So patients are going home with sufentanil on board, and if they should happen to take maybe a Vicodin or something like that that you can't control once they leave the office could be a problem, okay? So your 30 mics of fentanyl is actually equivalent to 300 micrograms of fentanyl or 30 milligrams of morphine. And even if only 50% absorbed, we're looking at a dose of 150 micrograms of fentanyl when everybody knows that 100, once you get past 100 micrograms of fentanyl, it's no longer a short-acting drug. So it is safe. It's going to be a wonderful experience for offices that use it, and it's safe until it isn't. Those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat. The fentanyl patch for post-op pain in narcotic-naive patients cause people to die. And what's going to happen with sufentanil, because it hasn't happened yet, sooner or later, patients will die. And I'm not going to tell you not to do it. I'm only going to tell you there will be no shortage of expert witnesses to come forward and give you the information. I present it. There'll be no shortage. Now, as far as general anesthesia, you have the acquisition cost, the machine, the maintenance, and the scavenging issues. You have to be prepared to treat malignant hyperthermia and you have to have drills for <coughs> danger. So neither propofol or ketamine trigger an H, and no approach is 100% safe, but the safe practice of medicine is not the perfection. So I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, my papers are on open access research gate, and my opioid free anesthesia lectures are on YouTube. This is more of a why to, why do you want to do this, as opposed to a how to. Like I said, it's painfully simple, but there you have it. Thank you.